Jewish educational opportunities in order to engage more children and families in meaningful, satisfying, and impactful Jewish learning. Leora began her career at Jesna in 1986 after serving as a researcher in the, at the American Jewish Committee and on the faculties of Trenton State University and College of St. Elizabeth, the Jewish Theological Seminary, and the University of Pennsylvania. She received her BA in psychology summa cum laude from the University of Michigan and her PhD in educational and development psycho developmental psychology from the CUNY Graduate Center. Dr. Isaacs. I have here. It's okay. Thanks. So thank you, Stephen. Um, I'd like to first ask for the people in the room if you could move forward. There are actually are kits, uh, navy blue kits on the tables that with materials that you'll need. And so that would be very helpful. And also, we're uh, in the room. We're a small group. I would say that rather than a convening, maybe we'll call this a consultation or a conversation. And so in order to facilitate and make sure that we actually can have that conversation less formally, it would be great if everybody could move forward and, and fill in. And I also want to acknowledge that there are um, about 80 people or more who have registered to attend um, virtually. I'm sure that they didn't know about the water situation, um, and so that wasn't uh, the issue. But um, so what we're going to try to do is to also provide them with an opportunity to join in the conversation, either via Twitter or via um, our, uh, our email, um, and, um, which is convenings at jesna.org. And as they have comments, uh, we're going to ask, I'm going to ask our, um, our colleague from the Jewish Education Project, Jessica, who is um, going to be monitoring and, and kind of uh, checking on what they're saying. And she's going to feed us the benefit of their questions and comments as well so that we can broaden out the conversation. So now the, the more formal introduction part. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased to welcome you to this third convening in our series on behalf of JASNA, the Jewish Education Project, and our co-sponsors, Federation CJA, ADCA, which is the Association of Directors of Central Agencies, um, New Cage, the JEA, Nate, and RENA, the three educators' organizations. Um, I especially want to thank uh, the Montreal Federation and the Brownman Foundation for their hospitality. And I want to thank everyone from near and far, especially um, those who traveled to be here and those on live stream for engaging with us in these conversations. So, um, so this, is this it? Got it. OK. So um, here's the, the Twitter feed um, and the email. Please, even if you're in the room and you feel like you want to immediately respond and be part of the conversation, please feel free to do that as well. Absolutely. OK. Um, so just a, a moment to set the context. The argument that Jewish education needs to change in order to adapt to the characteristics and needs of the 21st century is really not a chiddish or an earth-shattering epiphany. And we were, those of us who were here earlier in the day, um, were privileged to hear from John Wucher about how the changes are affecting not just the world, but Jewish education as well. With the largest percentage of Jewish potential learners enrolled in complementary programs in North America, combined with the generalized feeling that this form of education is not succeeding in engaging the majority of eligible learning, learners in meaningful, impactful learning and living, 
efforts have intensified over the past decade or so to do more than bemoan, rather to do something about it. At Jesna, joined by the Jewish Education Project and our partners, with activity stirring, we felt that the time was right to elevate the discussion. And so we launched a series of convenings for change makers on creating the future of complementary education. So if it's okay with everybody. And um, for those who are um, in, on the live feed, I, I meant to also mention that uh, hopefully you receive the attachments in advance so that when we go to certain documents, you will be able to open them up on your computers or if you printed them out, you'd be able to refer to them. So the goals, as you see on the screen, of these convenings are to explore and, sorry. The documents are also posted to the Ustream account for those people online. They can access it through the same Ustream account. Okay, so for those online, the documents are also posted to the Ustream account, and you can access it seamlessly. So there were three goals when we set out to, um, to, to plan and hold these convenings. The first was to explore and as assess current efforts that are underway to dramatically strengthen and transform complementary education. We wanted to think forward about what next steps might be in the process. And most importantly, we hope to build a network of activists in the world of complementary education who are committed to change and want to coordinate efforts with one another and not work either competitively or in silos. And so, as I said, we convened three um, meetings, conversations. The first was in January in New York City, where we focused on alternative models. And we asked the question, so what is different and new and succeeding and where are the obstacles and what are these various strategies that are being used to make change. In March, in Los Angeles, we moved to a different plane of discourse and we zoomed out to explore community change initiatives in complementary education. And we asked the question, so not focusing on the individual programs, how can the whole be greater than the sum of the parts? And what needs to happen within a community? And we began to introduce the notion of the educational ecosystem to think not only about the component parts, but about the dynamics and the atmosphere that are at play in order to both provide learning, meaningful learning opportunities and engagement opportunities, and also to understand what's impeding, what could be facilitating, and most importantly, how can we help make the ecosystem more adaptive to the, um, the existing conditions. And so today in Montreal, we're taking it up one more notch to think together about what it would take to build a network of change beyond individual programs, incorporating community-wide initiatives, and really thinking much more broadly. So just to bring everybody in the room kind of onto the same page, we wanted to share what some of the big takeaways were from our two previous convenings um, about what seems to be effective or critical for the leading change efforts. And some of these we've already touched on in our morning deliberations here in Montreal. So the value of creating a collaborative effort where parents work together with educators, the notion also of, of prosumers, the need to merge content and experience, coming right off the concluding conversation that we had this morning, that neither is sufficient in and of, in of itself, relationships, creating connections between learners and families, learners from day schools and congregational schools, congregation and community, relationships with those who aren't fully in the system either. Taking learning beyond the four walls, beyond school walls. Having options, and this came out loud and clear in both of the two prior convenings, 
um, different options with regard to content as well as modes of delivery and the understanding that one size clearly does not fit all and therefore introducing an element of choice into any educational program. We believe that these kinds of changes are much easier to make if institutions work as part of a larger system whose components can support, complement, and reinforce one another. And in order to think both, as I said before, about the components and the dynamics, we found it very helpful to think and talk in terms of the complementary education ecosystem. So what's an ecosystem? Well, thinking back to your science classes, it's a biological community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. For me, the power of the ecosystem metaphor is that it, one, maps the terrain and enables us to really focus on the component parts, which sometimes in some of the communities where I work, people, not everyone is aware of what's there, what can be drawn on, and that's an important piece. It helps identify the players the players who are regularly there and participating, those who aren't, who serve as um, facilitators of learning, supporters. It pushes me to think about atmospheric conditions and about natural resources. Most importantly, and I'm gonna reinforce this several times, it focuses me on the dynamics and the forces going beyond a mapping or even linking the silos to be able to analyze the factors at play and to think about how it might be possible to intervene in adaptive ways. So applying the ecosystem metaphor, and I want to invite the people online to also join in thinking about this and to, if you haven't already, to, to start um, tweeting and emailing in about what you're thinking about when you think about the metaphor and does it work for you and what are the limitations and how have we not pushed it far enough. But here's some of the things that we think about. So what are the characteristics of the environment in which complementary education operates? What are the atmospheric conditions, both positive and negative? What's out there in the world? Technology, prosumerism, um, the, the sovereign self. Who are the residents of the ecosystem? All of them. How much diversity does the system incorporate? Or are there just a lot of examples of the same thing over and over and over again? What are the natural resources, both within the Jewish part and more broadly? And are they being used as effectively and efficiently as possible? How do the components interact? How do the various species um, support and compete with one another? And also perhaps the nodes, the places within the ecosystem, how do they support and compete? What changes from the outside and from within call for new adaptations? Remember, the world has changed. So what are the specifics that demand thinking differently? And so there, therefore, what kind of reconfigurations are happening or are needed to be able to create a win-win for the inhabitants? Because the bottom line is, why does the ecosystem in, um, exist? It, it's for the inhabitants, it's, it's to enable them to live and, and be productive. So a reminder, communicate. So now we're gonna open this up and this is going to be a conversation for the people in the room and hopefully for the people online as well. I'm a visual learner and I often find it really helpful to have a diagram or a visual representation in order to figure things out. So let's see how this works for us today. In your kit or in, in your online packet, 
you'll find two ecosystem maps. Let's start with the one that's entitled the local ecosystem of complementary education. And if you could take a few minutes to review the draft that we've created as a starting point, and it's really intended, it's a, a black and white visual because we see it as a work in prog progress. So first, take a minute, make some notes for yourself about any additions, deletions, modifications that you would make. For those in the room, feel free to talk among yourselves around the table. For the live stream participants, please tweet or email your thinking. And in just a couple of minutes, I'm going to come down and ask you to share your thoughts and we'll begin to modify this map and, and see if we can either make it work for us or you can tell me that I should you know, stick to my day job and not think about graphing ecosystems. Okay. Hey, I'm going to give you just a couple more minutes to, to finish your, um, your internal conversations, and then we're going to open it up because I've heard some really important things that I think we should share across the room and across the airwaves.
Okay, for the, the benefit of our, our people who are online, um, if you speak, I'm going to give you this handheld mic. Please hold it like this, right? And speak directly into it. Otherwise, they're going to not hear anything. Okay, so uh, anyone have things that are blatantly missing or not so blatantly, things that should be added to the ecosystem, either in terms of the, the institutions or things in the atmosphere or the natural resources or inhabitants, anything. Who else? So there are two things for me. The um, curve on the top that notes all the um, kind of the, where it ends with constant busyness. So I'm wondering what uh, the part, helicopter parenting has, uh, how it, that affects as well, whereas parents are very differently involved with their kids than they were for sure when I was growing up. And the other thing in terms of the elements of the ecosystem, I'm wondering how non-Jewish organizations could somehow be also potential partners in whatever. Uh, I think it was um, possibly missing. It, it's very institutional. And what about informal venues? And you mentioned non-Jewish. But I would just say just general societal venues, um, anything from uh, someone's home. I didn't see homes here. Were there homes? Kind of. There's drawings of homes. Um, so the, a salon in someone's home, um, also a cafe um, or, or a library or, or maybe something that's more temporal, like a festival that occurs in many places. Yes, I was going to suggest along the line of festivals, uh, culture. Culture uh, and it and it gets played out both largely as in you know major community, you know walk for Israel and these kinds of events, but also in as in certainly in our community, um, there's a lot happening literally in the cafe scene, uh, where um, there's musicians and there's poets and there's there's an opportunity for Jewish culture coming for and that's the connection for many people. We also had a um, library, Jewish public library, um, cultural centers, arts. So uh, you know, we have the Siegel Center, so a venue for uh, regular arts, um, and we had universities. Anything else in terms of the atmosphere, the, the you know, kind of the, the world aura? But, or whatever you were going to say, I'm sorry. Okay, a couple of things. Uh, one is Chabad. It's an entity unto its own, and it reaches out not only as synagogues, but they do other programs, um, be it Mada or friendship circles. And um, one of the populations or non-learners or people not engaged are immigrants as part of community demography, perhaps. I was going to say that uh, it, it's nice to see the Jewish day schools and public schools as part of this ecosystem. And I guess it's just my original impression that when I would think of a term like complementary education, I'd fall into that, um, uh, that place where there's formal education and informal education. And yet here, uh, as part of the ecosystem, clearly both elements are part of what you would refer to as complementary education which I think is really important. Okay. Although grandparents would be included in friends and relatives or families, I would call them out in particular as a very uh, major influence in this ecosystem. Ooh, we got a lot. 
in, in terms of you know things that are external to the ecosystem but impacted very strongly in, in the Montreal focus, I would say the Quebec government. Uh, which is very, very yeah. intrusive in education on all levels. I think it's complicated because there's a lot of things that, you know, it, it's a question of how far are we going to go. So I'm wondering about DJs um, and wedding planners and event planners like that, the people who do the dancing at the bar and bat mitzvah celebrations. You know, those are pretty formative moments for our 12 and 13 year olds. Let's not forget those caterers. <laughs> exactly. I'm thinking about um, co-cultural organizations like Bechol Shon or Capers, Rabbi Capers Founier and his synagogue in Chicago and there are whole Jewish worlds being experienced that are co-cultural and outside of what ter they term the mainstream, but actually don't, are not at all represented mm -hmm. in this ecosystem. Good. A couple more, one is a daycare, uh, both before, early childhood daycare and, and after school daycare. It's just as another institutional, if you will, or a quasi-institutional element that it, it is important. and. Uh, having a lens of, of language, uh, the immigration comment is, is part of that, but it, it's also, I think that it shades and colors and, 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 and changes the way you run programs. Great. So I want to push you one more time. Anything beyond institutions, organizations, providers, places, but things in the arc that we've just because we had to, to graphically um, depict it, in the arc above or in the arc below, that are, it, it's just, it, it permeates. We've got to be aware of it as we're thinking about how we engage the, the learners and how we have interactions with the existing um, institutions and organizations. I'm thinking about the internet community. Okay, hey, just a couple more and then we're gonna zoom back. Food. <laughs> Food. Told you those caterers would get in there. Okay, so um, I'm gonna show my age, but maybe not because maybe it's a, a cult phenomenon. Has anyone here seen the National Film Board of Canada classic, either Cosmic Zoom or the movie Power of 10? No, I love it. it You've seen Cosmic Zoom. So I, I'm going to describe it in one sentence. Um, it's from the late 60s or 70s. That It starts out with a little boy rowing in a rowboat on a lake. And then it zooms in. And you see a mosquito on his hand. And you go in and you go into his veins and then into the blood cells. And you take a little trip around the, the human system. And then it zooms back out. And then very quickly it zooms back. And you see him on the lake and then in the state and in the country and you see the whole earth and then you see the entire um, universe, the, the solar system. So we, um, we're now going to zoom out. And I'd like to contemplate with you the continental ecosystem. And that's really tried what we try to depict here in your second map. So... Inside, you see the, the local regional one in the center in, in micro, and now we have zoomed out to look continentally, again, at organizations, institutions, but also at the forces, the processes, the atmospheric con conditions. So again, remembering that this is an initial sketch just to get you started. What's missing? What should be taken out? both in terms of the, um, the institutions and organizations, but also the culture. Talk among yourselves and then we'll talk again.
this year. I'm not bragging like I'm not. I think there's lots of your programs in the world. So to get the ball rolling, um, Jessica, is there anything from out in the field? Okay, not yet? All right. So, um, John's got the mic. Additions, deletions. Uh, national youth movements, so like Habo or BBYO, et cetera. There's a lot of overlap on the national system. The National Federation, National Foundations and Funders, Central Agency Networks, there seems to be a lot of redundancy at the national level. <laughs> yeah, that's being recorded. <laughs> uh, I would add govern governments into this as well. So the, the, the difference is that, um, that you have much more government support or interference, as somebody said, um, in Canada than we have in, in the United States. Uh, connected to government, um, and this I think applies to the U.S. as well, um, lobby, uh, lobbying and advocacy groups. And then, of course, if we're talking about governments, then Israel as well is, is somewhere in this. Oh, yes, thank you. Big miss. Big miss. Yeah. Um, same list, more details. Media outlets, uh, sources. Um, uh, social media, of course. Um, shopping was interesting, like stores, um, fashion, trendsetters, product sellers, retailers, those kinds of things. Um, and celebrity, we thought was interesting as well. Maybe some of the international efforts that might be viewed countercultural on the continent, like in Guatemala, the Converso movement, or, um, or what was I just thinking of? Um, some of the movements out of uh, some of the uh, countries in Africa to have rabbis ordained here and then go back and enhance and establish Jewish communities, or the uh, intentional effort for intermarriage in Jamaica to start expanding the Jewish community there, um, and how they might be viewed as countercultural here. I actually have two from Twitter. Um, Jane Walsh said that we should add national convenings and national conferences that take place throughout the year to the national ecosystem, and also suggested that instead of declining institutional loyalty, we change it to transforming institutional loyalties. OK, so we now have kind of the, the foundation of a map. And now John is going to talk to us about how to adapt the, uh, the map of the ecosystem. So as Leora indicated, the, the big question from our perspective is not, all right, what is the ecosystem today, but how can we make this a more productive ecosystem for 
ultimately the learners, um, whom we consider to be the, the ultimate beneficiaries, and in a somewhat different sense, but equally important for Jewish life, if you will, for the collective uh, enterprise and endeavor. So we've been looking, and uh, we're inviting you to, to take part in a work in progress. We've been looking over the last number of months for how to get a handle on this notion of ecosystem change, of how we're going to be changing the ecosystem to make it um, work better. And um, the piece that we've um, come to look at and think of as a potentially helpful heuristic device actually grows out of the work of somebody named Ron Adner, who is a uh, business professor, has written um, articles and journals, et cetera, uh, and also a book uh, from which we gave you an excerpt in advance called The Wide Lens. And what Adner tries to do is to look at the process of innovation through this so-called wide lens, because his basic uh, proposition is that in order to make change effectively within complex environments, and I hope everybody would concede that we're working in the Jewish community in a pretty complex environment, which you have made even more complex over the course of this afternoon, in order to make change, in order to innovate in a complex environment and add value, you can't simply focus on the innovation itself or the change itself. You have to look <clears throat> at what he calls the innovation ecosystem. And he identifies two critical components of that ecosystem for anyone trying to make innovation. The first are the people that he calls the co-innovators. And his question is, who else needs to innovate or who else needs to change in order for my innovation to matter? The second are what he calls the adoption change. Who needs to adopt my innovation or who needs to go along with my change before the end user can really derive the value that we're seeking from it? So his basic notion is that if we want to think creatively about the process of innovation and change in any system, we need to be attending to these. He also is very concerned with how we understand the concept of value. Uh, what is the value that people receive? And he wants to make sure that we're aware that value is the product of um, an equation which is gain minus cost. Value is not something that um, you know, is an absolute, but rather reflects the balancing in the real world of what we gain by any change that we make versus what we lose in making that change. And his point, which I think is really critical in terms of where we want to try to go with this, is that for innovation to be successful, all the members of the ecosystem need to see that innovation or see that change as adding value. The value has to be distributed among all of the members so that no one ends up as a clear loser. That doesn't mean that the value has to be distributed equally. There may be greater value for some components, but he at least postulates or hypothesizes that if somebody who is either a co-innovator or part of the adoption uh, chain, is going to be clearly made worse off by the change that you're proposing, at a minimum, you're going to have difficulty in getting that change to take place. And most likely, um, it will fall apart. So his argument is that if we want to produce more overall value, and an equitable distribution of that value, we need to be creative in thinking about how to reconfigure our ecosystems. It's not enough to say, well, hey, this will be great for the synagogues, or you know, this will be wonderful for the, the, the families. We have to be thinking about how does it affect 
other components of the ecosystem. And he argues that there are five levers, he calls them levers, that we can use for reconfiguring ecosystems. If we say we want to make this change, what do we do in order to actually do it? And he uses the example, interestingly enough, uh, in his book of a company called Better Place, which you may have heard of. This is the company that is introducing electrical vehicles into Israel, uh, Denmark as well. They've been having something of a difficult time since he wrote the book. They've recently announced that they're pulling out of the North American market, but they are going ahead and trying to make this work in Israel. And if you followed any of the news about this, and I think it's gotten a fair amount of publicity, at least in the Jewish press, and a little bit in the business press as well, you know that their chidush, their innovation is, you go, uh, you buy a, uh, a, a car, but the battery belongs to the company. And the batteries are critical for electric cars. So what you're able to do is you take your car, and when your battery is running down, you go into a charging station. You don't have to wait for your battery to recharge. They swap your battery out. They give you a new battery. Off you go again. And this has, according to um, Adner, huge advantages on multiple levels. First of all, it means that as battery technology improves, you're not stuck with an old battery, uh, which you otherwise would be and would be a real detriment to uh, buying an electric car. Second, it means that the problem of not the electrical grid, the electrical system, not knowing when it will need to deliver peak power overnight, you know, you might have thousands of people charging their batteries, but unused capacity during the day. Well, this way, the company can spread out, since it controls the charging of the batteries, it can spread out when the batteries get charged in order to cut a deal with the electrical distribution system to get the power at the cheapest possible rate. So there are a number of these advantages that make this um, attractive to, uh, to Adner. And in his analysis, he says, here's how they are basically reconfiguring the ecosystem. First of all, they're separating items that otherwise would have been thought to be together. In this case, they're separating the car from the battery. They're two separate entities. You buy the car, in effect, you rent the battery. They're also combining things that otherwise might have been separate. So they're combining the battery, a charging infrastructure, those charging stations that I mentioned, and how they purchase electricity from the grid, as I talked about. You're also relocating certain functions. Normally, in America, you buy an electric car, you pay the electric company for the electricity. But here, Better Place pays for the electricity. You pay for the miles that you drive, because that's how you're charged, based on the number of miles you drive. So they've relocated a basic function, namely, who buys the electricity from the grid, from the individual owner to the company. The fourth way that you can do things is by adding new elements into the ecosystem. In this case, they've added the charging stations, which previously didn't exist, and they've added this kind of integrated operating system that ties together the various pieces of the distribution system, the charging infrastructure, and the charging schedule. And finally, he says, you can reconfigure an ecosystem by subtracting certain things. In this case, what you're subtracting is the need for the electric companies to manage grid overload because they have a contract, they have a deal with Better Place, and Better Place will, in effect, manage the grid overload um, you know, for them. So that's eliminated. Now, if we want to transfer this, then, into the realm of Jewish education, how might we do it? So let me give a couple of examples, and then we're going to turn you all loose on some case studies. So, for example, we might separate, to take number one, the teaching of Hebrew language from religious school. That's actually being done in the form of Hebrew charter schools that are now springing up in the United States. They do the Hebrew. The after-school religious school programs that are often associated with them or are made available in conjunction, they don't have to teach Hebrew. So you've separated two things. You could combine after-school care with Jewish learning. 
Well, that's also being done. Those of you here this morning heard me talk about Jewish kids groups in Atlanta. There's now a network of close to a dozen of these programs that combine after-school care, which families generally need in a world of two career families, with your Jewish learning. You could relocate activities by, for example, having Jewish activities where the students are instead of trying to bring the students to where the Jewish activities are. Well, again, we've got some examples of that. In the States, we have programs like Jewish Student Connection, which goes into high schools and runs programs in the high schools. We have a program called TCI, the Curriculum Initiative, which does the same thing or something similar for private schools, for private prep schools. You could add a new element. For example, you could add informal programming and service opportunities to formal classes. Again, many of the community Hebrew high schools in the states are now doing exactly that. They've recognized that offering formal classes alone is not sufficiently attractive, so they're adding in the service components and the informal activities, and this may be a, a bit of relocation as well, that previously were done by youth groups, some of which are thriving, some of which are not. And finally, you could eliminate or reduce things as well. For example, you could eliminate or reduce travel to the program site by using online learning. And we have examples of that. We have one in the room. Sarah Steinberg is going to talk about Shalom Learning. There are also other programs like iLearn, um, like uh, Nisayon, which is a program that um, uh, essentially substitutes several intensive camping experiences per year for the weekly drive to Hebrew school or totally online Hebrew schools. So the key in all of this, and I've tried to give just a couple of examples of, of how this model might be applied to think about reconfiguration, the key is to look at the entire ecosystem that in order to implement an innovation successfully, we need to be thinking about how that innovation is going to affect the various parts of the ecosystem, and within that framework, how we can deploy these and perhaps other levers, because this is certainly not necessarily an exhaustive list, in order to be able to actually begin to make changes in ways that will provide greater value certainly greater value, as I said, for the learner, but hopefully in many ways greater value for other parts of the ecosystem, excuse me, as well. Now, the challenge, of course, is putting this to work. And so now we want to get to the, um, uh, hopefully, the fun part of this. Um, we um, have three case studies, all of which are located in a fictional community that we've called Springvale not to be confused with Springfield, because we figured that uh, that was already taken. But um, the, um, the community of Springvale has been described. You have this in your kits, and maybe some of you even had a chance to read it in advance. The community of Springvale is, is described. And then we've given you sort of three scenarios, three cases. One case in which day schools and summer camps are seeking to enter the market, if you will, as complementary education providers. Uh, a second case study in which the community is trying to create a core of full-time educators. And a third case study about creating what we're calling a continental innovation diffusion network. What would happen if Springvale got together with a group of other communities to create something on a continental level? What we'd like to do for the next number of minutes is to have you work on these case studies. In order to do that, I think it will make sense for those of you who are at tables that are not close to capacity to join with a table, another table, and try to create something that will be a little bit, uh, a little bit closer to uh, capacity. Um, what we're going to ask you to do is to um, read through the general background. That applies to everybody. That gives you the, uh, the general scene in Springvale. We don't swear that this is, you know, that this is exactly how it would, would be. You may notice some things where you would say, oh, it would never be like that, or that would never be the case. The numbers don't add up. 
We, we apologize. We just tried to do our best to, you know, to, to put together a plausible community. And then I'm going to ask each table to work on one of the uh, cases. So I'm going to ask this table over here in the, in the front to work on case number one. I'm going to ask this table here, where Barra is located, to work on case number two. And I'm going to ask the table in the rear, if, if you want to work in a small group, that's OK, to work on case number three. And then the same thing on this side, case one up front, case two in the middle, case three um, in the rear. So we will, um, we will take about, um, uh, oh, I would say probably around 15 minutes or so uh, for you to work, read your background, talk through the case. You'll notice that at the end of each case, there are three questions. Same questions, by the way, for all three of the cases. What value would each of these reconfigurations provide for each of the key actors involved, beginning with the learners? We want to keep them at the focus. Value, remember, is gain minus cost. What potential costs would these reconfigurations impose on each of the actors? Because that's where we typically run into problems. Usually it's not the benefits, which are often, you know, sound great. Oh, that would be wonderful. Uh, you know, we'll get more kids, you know, whatever. It's when we begin to drill down into the costs. And then the third, which is really the most important, is for you to think about what could be done to increase the value or mitigate the costs of these reconfigurations so that they're more likely to be implemented successfully. And after you've had a chance to work on the cases, we will come back and ask you to report to the group as a whole with a particular focus on uh, number three. Any questions about the instructions? Those of you who are online, we hope there are some of you online. We know there are some. Um, we would invite you to pick one of the cases. If you're with a group, and some cases we know people are, are watching with a, another group, work as a group. If you're there as an individual, um, just go ahead and, and pick a case or, you know, or two cases. Read through them yourself and jot down your own uh, thoughts about the questions. If they're tweetable, feel free to tweet them. If they're not, this is where you can certainly email to convenings at jesna.org, and we will monitor the email and try to introduce your comments as well when we come back for the discussion. So there are the questions. I put them up. And uh, if there are no questions here, go to it.
Two minute warning. Okay, I'm going to ask us to reconvene. We're going to spend a few minutes um, debriefing on the cases, hearing from the, the tables that worked on them, and then we'll take a little stretch and break because I know people are going to need that. So um, can we start with uh, case number one? We had two tables working on case number one. And can you – I forgot to ask the tables to designate a reporter, but – Hopefully, in such a sophisticated group, you anticipated my error, <laughs> and somebody will volunteer to get me off the hook. All right, Joni. So let's hear from this table, and then we'll move to the, to the other table. You're on camera. Did, did you turn on? We had a, a lot of. Uh, it's on. Is, there it goes. Okay, uh, we had a lot of conversation, uh, particularly about the two different ideas uh, promoted here. One, the need for an after-school program, and would the day school be able to provide that? Uh, in a nutshell, and then two, this uh, group of uh, nine, ninth and tenth graders going to their college-age students to think about uh, sort of bringing camp year-round. Uh, one idea was to kind of meld them into one. How could you solve both of these issues together um, uh, in the day school or something like that? In the end, we had a lot of issues <laughs> around uh, where did these kids live who need to be uh, accommodated after school if we separated them out between the day school issue and, and, and the other college thing. Uh, where did they live? Was this day school in a place that parents want to send their kids? Is it convenient? Is it comfortable? Is it easy? Um, who, what expertise are they going to be using at the day school? What, where are the synagogues going? We just had a hundred questions, actually. We didn't solve any problems. Um, and I couldn't possibly, although I'd really like to be able to nutshell them out unless someone else at my table can do that. 
but there were just a lot of uh, questions. Nothing was unsolvable, and we came up with certain different uh, ideas, business models, about how a day school could provide certain service so that there would be revenue streams that would come to each of the synagogues, as well as the day school, so that everybody could, it would be a win-win for everybody. Because one of the things we thought about, which I think happens a lot in these discussions, is that, um, is somebody going to be hurt in the process? Um, and everybody needs to adapt, but what happens to the synagogue, uh, synagogue schools if now all of a sudden it's happening at the day school? Uh, we could go on and on, but if there are other, other thoughts that I didn't touch, okay, done and done. <laughs> if you want to have more questions, we'll, come over to our all right, table. We'll, <laughs> we'll pass the mic to the next table. Uh, Okay, uh, we had a number of observations and fewer solutions. One of the observations was that the Orthodox students seem to be completely out of this picture. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a statement of fact without any particular recommendation. There seems to be a definite... Um, uh, value in adding an intensive experience, or as the model says, the best of camp to existing programs, because if you merely have the intensive experience, there is a large fallow period necessarily between intensive experience and intensive experience. And a third uh, observation that we made is that existing educational programs are likely wedded to whatever their current model is, and therefore any sort of basic change in the current model to which they're wedded has to be treated very gingerly and with great diplomacy. Good, let's hear from uh, the tables that worked on case number two. Good one. <laughs> Hello. Um, so we were, we were asked to look at uh, a community core of full-time educators. We did not get through the entire challenge, uh, so we made it through the first two questions. But first, we, what we did was identify um, who the actors were and uh, what the impact of bringing um, this core community of full-time educators would be to um, each one of them. Um, so we only, we only got through two of them for the first question, which was um, what value would each of these um, reconfigurations provide for the key actors involved? And we saw that they would be um, the learners. The, uh, there would be an increase in quality programs um, from sharing these, uh, this group of five educators. The synagogues themselves, um, which would have one educator on their at, as acting in, in a home-based capacity, um, would get a scholar in residence. They would have more outreach capability. Um, they would maybe get uh, increased membership value, uh, values for their members of the synagogue. Um, stronger professionals inside their um, uh, their synagogue, but maybe better infrastructure, and then uh, increased perspective on the goals of the community vis-a-vis -vis, um, education. Um, we did not get to um, the, the DJE, the philanthropists, the educators, the schools, and the library, but in the second question, um, what are the potential costs? We, we did look at um, the learners that probably there would be some kind of service fees or membership fees um, to, to participate in this extra learning. The, to the synagogues, there might be a little bit of an extra cost in terms of overhead for housing some of these um, uh, scholars and residents. Um, they, they would have to share resources perhaps with um, other synagogues. Um, there might be an initial investment and they might lose um, some kind of local support um, for, their, um, for their specific synagogue. Um, to the DJE, we thought that perhaps the cost would be that they would have to coordinate this entire process of sharing, um, training the teachers, um, filtering through applicants, um, and trying to figure out who the best candidates would be. Um, and then, of course, there would be a fundraising element um, to try to match the philanthropist's fund. Of course, the philanthropist would be on the hook for one-third of this program. Um, the educators themselves would, would maybe feel strained. There might be costs to their um, 
um, ability to focus, so maybe too many uh, multiple allegiances, um, having to operate in too many spaces at one time, um, and then their work-life balance might be put out of whack, and that's as far as we could get. I'm really tempted to say ditto, <laughs> but I will add. Um, so we, including everything that Mike just said, no, we actually didn't get as, as far as they did, but uh, with respect to value, specifically with respect to the learners, uh, we came up with the potential for uh, roving expertise, which is actually written into it, but it's, it then creates a heightened sense of or uh, quality of program, a, as Mike was saying, but also the important part was the home base connectivity as well. So, uh, and if you didn't read what the, uh, what the actual case is, you should probably read it so you can understand a little bit more. Uh, but um, it would allow for, let's say, a reform uh, temple to uh, to co to connect to an educator who's from a different uh, who's from the conservative movement, for example, who happens to be specializing in uh, technology. Okay, that idea, but still, that person still has a home base that they go back to. Um, the the it also creates a, a, a I guess a bigger systematic approach to learning. Um, potential for meeting learners where they were is a little bit uh, heightened. Um, we also recognize that there is a stronger potential for much, um, much uh, more in-depth professional development. And then the, the last thing that I remember, because I didn't know I was being nominated for this, um, was from a cost perspective that we had to be weary of the um, the potential for our the educators that are already in the system, how they might feel either alienated or uh, a little bit nervous about the change that's coming uh, or not on board, blah, blah, blah. All right, case study number three, which shifts us to the continental arena. Um, so we were f uh, faced with a challenge where um, our case study was about complementary education programs um, and in um, creating programs that were more engaging and impactful. And for whatever reason, um, we as a team were very focused on the costs of this <laughs> program. <laughs> Um, so we went right to the second question. So essentially what the directors in our situation were trying to envision was a central clearinghouse uh, at the continental level, a team of innovative coaches, um, regular webinars, and also uh, conferences and regional gatherings. And we were discussing sort of, and I don't know if this was my fault because I took the conversation there, but we were discussing in, in regards to potential costs, sort of, you know, it's great that these fake people in our scenario have all of these great ideas, but what about the people who are currently employed in these, um, in these scenarios and what kind of, um, I used the word resistance, are we going to face when we say to them, hey guys, guess what? We have these great new ideas and we want to employ them and you know, we want you to be on board. So some of the costs obviously that we were talking about were of course, you know, you know, the dollars when it comes to things like websites and webinar webinars and conferences, but also the cost of um, you know, keeping staff up to date educationally so that the staff themselves don't become obsolete, so that we don't come in saying that we have great new ideas, but you don't know how to use a blog and you don't know what Facebook is, so you're no longer useful in our scenario. So that was, I think, um, am I forgetting anything? I mean, that was essentially what our conversation was focused about, was not um, losing people who have large amounts of experience and replace them with our flashy new wonderful ideas. And our final table. <laughs> so to, to attempt not to repeat what was already said, but I'm sure I will anyway to some extent. Um, so the idea of a central clearinghouse is a good idea. It's always great to find new and creative ways of doing things and to be able to present that to other people. So the concept is a good concept. We also talked, like Samantha mentioned, to uh, the, the problem of um, bringing in sort of an outside 
group of individuals who are going to do something new as opposed to looking at the closest link or people who are currently doing it and saying, hey, we would like you to add this to your dossier. We would like, you know, you're doing something that's similar. Um, can you add this? We would like you to look at additional models, ideas, et cetera, et cetera. So the problems that come along with, and you talk about there would be value added, but there's also a cost to creating something that might be isolated from other agencies. Um, so, uh, so that's something that we discussed at this table. Um, and, and that would relate to the cost as well. Um, in terms of the... Um, increasing the value or mitigating the cost. We, we looked at the different ideas and we spoke a little bit about the webinars and the conference. And we said that the ideas are sort of standard ideas, but we have to recognize that um, a webinar is sort of like a spray and pray concept where you bring people together and you present ideas both in, a, in, a, in, this, in this conference and in these webinars, but unless you're willing to go deep you're probably going to have that spray and pray concept where people come away with a little bit of an idea. And I think we have to move away from um, meeting once a month and, and sharing ideas with people over a webinar. It, just because it's easy to do it through technology doesn't make it a good thing to do. And I, I fear that we are doing too much of the distance learning. I don't mean distance by technology, but I mean superficial at the expense of going deep. Because if you really want change to happen and if you really want people to be able to learn new ways of doing things, you've got to invest heavily in them learning new skills, habits, and behaviors. Great, any other comments now in general from the group about either what you've heard from other tables or reflections on the process of change. We're not, I just want to underscore, we're not advocating for these particular changes. These are just examples that we pulled together uh, to try to get the kind of conversation that uh, took place uh, to happen. So we're not advocating that we must have a core of community educators or anything. We really wanted to try to bring to the surface the challenges of making change, whether it's making change at the communal level or making change at the, um, you know, at the national level. So don't feel that you have to you know, defend or uh, attack a particular idea, but are there thoughts that are suggested by the process about this notion of working together in order to make change? Want to give the mic? Yeah, you need the mic. Uh, and, oh, is that is that true? <laughs> so, uh, I need. To, I'll look at John instead. I can't do it. Uh, John, this was uh, very interesting. A lot of the discussion that came out was uh, illuminating and important. Uh, what interested me also was you had. Uh, I've forgotten his name. Ad, Ad, Adner, Ron Adner. Adner. So we had these, you know, the add-on, the separate, the this, that. Would have been kind of interesting also, uh, and it's for a different day, to have to kind of pay attention to that. And so how would these things, how might these things look if you had to look at the possibilities of his, I don't know, whatever those things yeah. are called, right? And what, uh, levers. Levers. Uh, it just interested me to imagine what kind of uh, uh, program or project or new organization we might put together using those levers. Good. We, we actually tried to embed some of those levers the in the cases, but hidden, you know, kind of things. But that's part of the, you know, the challenge is how, how, do you, you know, how do you begin to think conceptually and also practically at the same time. I think one or two more comments, and then we'll wrap up this section. So. Um, I had a couple of comments from Twitter Oops. to share. Oh, oh, hold on one minute. Do you have a mic there? I do. Okay. okay. Make Is sure it on? it's on. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, Sid Singer mentioned that he thinks that Adler's approach is useful, but it's important to note that he was not concerned with upsetting the current stakeholders. And then Karen Levine mentioned that a central clearinghouse tapping, for ta tapping talent from inside um, needs sustained and deep experiences, not spray and pay to make change happen. Great. 
And I have a couple of comments here from the email that I'll get to in a minute, but let's hear from Jim. And well, it occurs to me that in the training programs of uh, Jewish educational leaders in the future, there needs to be a strong component about how to manage change. Because I keep hearing from each of the different groups, this is a stumbling block, this is an issue. And the idea itself, while compelling, will die a thousand cuts without change management. Yeah, that, so. that is probably the single biggest point that, that Adner tries to make in his business context, but that I think we all sense holds true too. A good idea is not enough. And that's really where I think we in Jewish education actually have a lot to learn from people, whether it's Adner or others who are involved in doing this kind of change work in other settings, how rigorous you need to be in analyzing things. I mean, this is only one particular cut, and Adner's strength is in trying to analyze the value, the gains, the costs for particular uh, um, actors in the system. There are other approaches, but what they all share is that they try to be not casual and haphazard about change, but rather pretty rigorous about saying, if you want this to work, you got to really do the hard work of identifying who's going to win, who's going to lose, how will this play out, who will make this happen, et cetera, et cetera. We have, okay, let, yeah, let's get Ed, and then I'm going to read a, a comment or two from here, and we'll wrap up and take a little break before we bring our panel back. Thank you. Uh, in our community, we found that um, two interesting, uh, uh, I was going to call them barriers, not so much barriers as much as, as horses uh, or, or uh, steeplechases that we have to get through, over and through, is one is actually coming to a great deal of clarity of what's the problem and what a solution looks like. And it's not simple, and it isn't straightforward. Um, even we were just talking around our table, what's complementary education, what's good enough, what isn't. Um, what are we actually talking about? And the second thing is that it's all very well, f and I represent a central department of Jewish education, for the Department of Jewish Education directors to say, here's the solution, or here's the, here's the problem, here's the solutions, but it, you, you need the champions in the field who actually have to embrace that and then share what the issues are, the problems, and what a solution looks like before you can really begin to start that analysis that you're talking about, or, or maybe that's part of that analysis that you're talking about, Jonathan, because all that becomes part of the, the, the grist for the mill that helps you understand what will work and what, what are the winners that you want to support or you can support. Great. So some of the comments we got online were about the specific cases, and I'll just give a, a, a brief taste because I think there were some, some interesting insights from people who are... Who are uh, tuning in on the live stream, as they say. Uh, Danny Margolis from Boston, uh, who had experience a number of years ago with a full-time community educators project, um, notes that there are, um, you know, there, for, from his perspective, there were two critical areas of added value. One was institutional programming, that there's exponentially more time devoted to creating interactive materials, programming that integrates content, that simply having this time available, that one of the things we're lacking in the complementary education world, plain and simple, is time, and that full time makes a big difference. Saul may want to talk about that from his experience within a single congregation that uh, had full time educators. And Danny also notes that, that uh, parents and families have the opportunity to relate to a Jewish role model more frequently because there's, again, there's more, uh, more opportunity for uh, contact. Uh, Jane West Walsh, uh, commenting on the first, um, really says um, it's camp plus day school plus complementary education. If we take that as a starting point, it might help us to think of new ways to accomplish the vision, that it's really about looking at the, at, at, at the, the potential of the whole. And uh, again, she cites another example uh, of success in terms of full-time educators, Omaha, Nebraska in the, um, uh, in the 80s, uh, in the 1980s. And again, one of the challenges that I think we have in Jewish education in general is we don't necessarily build on our successes. We create successful models, and we don't necessarily um, create a second generation or a third generation. It's one of the reasons that I'm uh, so intrigued by what's happening now with the spread of those after-school 
Hebrew school programs, which is being nurtured by uh, my colleague Joni Blinderman from the Covenant Foundation, which has created a network of these kinds of programs. Because very often good ideas just sort of disappear into the, uh, into the ether. And Neely Simchai, who's a, um, a, an environmental uh, educator, um, notes that uh, in terms of uh, this, again, the full-time educator uh, scenario, what could be done to increase value or mitigate costs, get the teachers to really have a role in their own professional development on a vote on who these five teachers would be. An interesting way of thinking about how could you take the part-time educators and make the full-time educators feel not like an imposition on them or somebody who's out to take their jobs, but rather real resources for them, which I think, again, is a, is a wonderful example of how to think positively. So I will simply conclude by saying that um, you know, from, from our perspective over uh, the last number of years, we've been impressed by um, the volume and creativity of change that's taking place. Leora alluded to this in her uh, opening uh, comments. But we've also become very much aware that the change process, as all of the literature indicates, is never a simple or, uh, you know, or linear one. And our hope is that by looking at some of these changes in the context of an ecosystem approach, we can do a better job of identifying not only where the potential challenges are going to come from, but also who and where are resources that could be brought to bear that we might not initially be thinking about to help make those changes really take root and uh, establish themselves solidly. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a little five-minute break, take a stretch if you need to use the restrooms downstairs, and when we reassemble, we'll introduce a panel to talk about how does this really work in the, uh, in, in the world of uh, Jewish ed today. Those of you online, thanks again for your participation via Twitter and email. We'll be back shortly.
All right. Yeah. I think I lost them, so I'm going to go find them. But I have some uh, questions. Yeah. 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 Ye
questionnaires went to fill just before they sure. leave, so at some point. Sure, and yeah. if you want to announce that I did order water and okay. caffeinated soft drinks. All right. We're going to start again in one minute. If there are folks outside, particularly panelists outside, <laughs> please come back in. Okay, thank you for everybody for being so punctual, getting back to our seats. Okay, so just as a, a quick recap, what, what have we accomplished? We identified the, the, um, the elements and the forces and dynamics in local and continental ecosystems. We explored levers for reconfiguring um, the, the ecosystem to make it more robust. Um, and now we're going to turn to the question, how can we mobilize to actually affect the changes that we've been talking about? And we're lucky to have a panel of folks who actually who have been doing the work in the field so that we can learn from them. We have uh, Saul Kaiserman to my immediate left. Um, who's the Director of Lifelong Learning at Temple Emmanuel in New York. He's a Mandel Jerusalem Fellow, and he formerly was a, a Director at Central Synagogue, where he instituted some ecosystem changes. We have um, Sid Weissman in the center seat, who's the Director of Innovation and Congregational Learning at the Jewish Education Project in New York City, working on the community-wide level. And she leads a team that um, supports the creation of Jewish learning environments to positively nurture the lives of learners. And Sid also teaches organizational dynamics, curriculum design, and accompanying families on their spiritual journey whew, at the New York campus of HUC. Our third panelist is um, Elizabeth Perez from right here in Montreal. She's the Director of Community Planning and Allocations, and she has um, overseen and, and nurtured um, JQMTL, and the Jewish Learning Initiative. And we have Jim Rogason, who's the Chief Learning Officer of USCJ. He was the former head of a number of day schools, and they're in, engaged in some ecosystem change. And um, finally, at the end, we have Sarah Steinberg, who's the CEO of Shalom Learning. She has more than 30 years' experience on the higher education leadership level. Um, 
especially in um, strategic marketing and implementation and business planning. She worked at Johns Hopkins for nearly 20 years and most recently as the provost for student affairs and she's the adult education chair at her synagogue. So we have people with a broad range of approaches. Um, and what we're going to do, I spoke earlier about that movie, Cosmic Zoom. We're going to start by focusing in on the institutional level, and then we're going to zoom back to the community, to the continental, and then really look at the entrepreneurial world as well. So I'm going to start with a question. I'm going to ask each of you to respond. Um, and then we will um, have more of a conversation. As I said, each of you has been involved in efforts to reconfigure a, uh, your ecosystem. Now, from your perch in the community, on the continental level, um, in the for-profit world, I'd like each of you to please share what it is that you've been doing about your work, how you're doing it, and what levers you've been pressing or pulling. So we'll, uh, we'll start with Saul. Thank you, Leora. Uh, I'm going to speak about a program that we did with our seventh graders at Temple Emanuel called Mitzvah Corps that I think is illustrative of the kind of changes that we're talking about. And the first thing I want to do is give credit to Danny Mishkin, our coordinator of youth learning and engagement, who is really the person behind um, this idea. So uh, with our seventh grade, we had problems that were similar to those that are faced by other uh, congregational schools, a, a, a decrease in attendance over the course of the seventh grade year from the start to the conclusion, and the sorts of things that that you know, pointed out to us were what the students really found relevant changed once they became a bar bat mitzvah. Before that, their interest in Hebrew was, I want to get as much practice so that when I walk up and I'm on the bima, I feel confident. And as soon as that date passed, they were like, why would we possibly be interested in doing this any longer? It's done. So, and, and another issue was that for seventh graders, uh, the scheduling was becoming an incredibly complicated fashion Man, uh, a matter that they, they had difficulty finding the time to commit to be present um, in the school setting. Um, so the way that Mitzvah Corps was set up to work, um, we, we broke the year into units, seven units over the course of the year, and each unit was divided into three sessions, a learning session, an action session, and a reflection session. In the learning session, the students would learn about a cause or a mitzvah, mitzvah core, that um, stemmed from Jewish values, that study texts related to it, and about an agency locally in New York City that worked to respond to that issue. Then in the action session, they would go out and volunteer, do hands-on service in that agency. And then the reflection session, they would come back to Temple Emanuel and meet as a group to discuss their experience, both what kinds of things were we able to do in that brief time that we were there, and how did the experience impact upon us as the learners. Each of these sessions was offered both on a Sunday morning and on a Wednesday afternoon, which allowed for much more flexibility. Students could come on a Sunday to a learning session, and then if the Wednesday, that the next Sunday didn't work for them, come on the Wednesday for an action session, refer, return on a Sunday for a reflection session. Um, and because we didn't say there's a mandatory attendance requirement, but rather, if you complete a certain number of units, 18 sessions in total, you'll become a mitzvah messenger. We incentivized attendance even if it was somewhat sporadic over the course of the year, so that students might say, I can come for the fall, can't actually come in the winter because of sports commitments, but then we'll come back in the spring in order to finish up uh, my 18 points and become a mitzvah messenger. And those students then got to vote together on what would be the single agency that they would all volunteer in together as eighth graders. So the students who had had the most exposure to the you know, largest number of different agencies then got to be the ones to decide which one will we, we be focusing on in a more consistent way. Um, so along with kind of responding to the problems in schedule structuring and incentivizing kids to keep coming back, um, I, th I think a, a key component was that originally we offered this as an alternative 
to our regular seventh grade program. You could do this instead of our regular seventh grade classroom experience, or you could do it as an add-on, like in addition to it. By our fourth year of doing it, we said we can drop our regular program and just do mitzvah core as our regular seventh grade program. Because when we first started off, people were like, what, you're going to tell kids that they don't have to come every week? They saw this as completely illegitimate. But when we started seeing that kids were continuing to come back after becoming Barabat Mitzvah to mitzvah core, but not continuing to come back to our regular seventh grade program, and when we were having you know, three or four four kids left in our regular program and 15, 20, 25 kids who had completed the year of mitzvah core, even if their scheduling had been sporadic, we said, well, this now is something that is just the way we do things around here. And it's just become a part of how we do things at Temple Emmanuel. So I think it's an example of how we, we played around with some of those levers. That's great. So Sid, let's bump up to the community level. Bon am I on? Can you hear me? Nope. Bon après-midi. Je suis très heureuse d'être ici. Je travaille à New York auprès des cinq ans synagogues. Notre travail est d'enrichir l'éducation dans le quotidien des enfants. Maintenant, but on okay. <laughs> Did I do okay? Very well. Okay. <laughs> Very well. D'accord? Um, what did I say? You just ordered the fish. I have no idea. <laughs> Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Good afternoon. I work for the Jewish Education Project. Uh, we work with over 50 synagogues in New York, and the assumption that we make is that the existing religious school model coming to a classroom for X hours a week, no matter how interesting that classroom is, will not be enough to grow children who are strengthened in this world by Jewish life. And therefore, our work has to be about changing that structure and model. So what we see in New York, we've been able to help congregations create models like Saul spoke about. Models where family and children are celebrating and learning on Shabbat together. Uh, models that are more camp-like, more lived Judaism than learned about Judaism. And I think the piece I'd like to share with you comes from a midah, a virtue of humility. And I need to share that with you. In my own leadership, when I began, I felt if I'm most creative, if I'm most strong, I'll be able to achieve the goals. And we know how foolish that was in my youth. And I learned that I had to have a team. And that the more I brought people with great gifts together, inspired by a mission and a purpose, we together could achieve. OK, that was OK on the humility spectrum, but not humble enough. And now in the Jewish Education Project, all that we have accomplished is that teaching from the rabbis about, you know, we're dust, and yet we're also close to the angels. So we recognize no matter how many millions of dollars we receive, no matter how great our internal team is, we cannot accomplish our goal without partnerships. And I'm just going to give you a quick alphabet soup of who have been the partners where we have had to say, we are not expert in how to do this. We must turn to. We have a deep partnership with the Experiment in Congregational Education that comes from HUC. We've had a deep partnership with Leadership Institute, which is a partnership, here comes the alphabet, of HUC and JTS, the seminaries of the reform and conservative movements. We work, here are more letters, the ERPs, Nili Simcha, Simcha was, on the tele, uh, was on the internet. 
We work with Avada Arts and bring people like that to congregations. We have another project with Foundation for Jewish Camp. And Foundation for Jewish Camp brings money to say we want more kid, uh, kids' heads in beds. And how do we help synagogues accomplish that and also make learning more camp-like? I'll say two more and I'll stop. And the next is we have CEs, coalition educators. We believe that for congregations to stop being the drop-off Hebrew school, they're not staffed enough. You're going to ask what are the structure, what are the things that keep us from changing the ecosystem? Our structures don't allow it. So coalition educators are full-time people who work in three synagogues, not only to be teachers, but to be what we say engines of innovation. And they also work for our agency. And the last kind of changing the ecosystem I'll leave you with, and you can visit us on innovatingcongregations.org, We've brought 50 congregations together in something called the Coalition of Innovating Congregations to have a network of support to say we're all in this for the same mission. We can learn from each other. I'll take Saul's clever idea and I'll add your clever idea and I'll be in learning with you so that we can support each other, learn from each other. Au revoir. So um, I'm uh, going to talk to you a little bit about the Federation CJ and where the JQ Montreal Initiative, which is actually a co-sponsor uh, for today. Um, we were lucky enough to have the Claudine and Stephen uh, Bronfman Family Foundation act as a, a supporter, a big financial supporter to the initiative. So that's what kick-started it. Um, what we're seeking to do is for Federation to be really a catalyst and a facilitator in increasing Jewish learning and Jewish literacy in Montreal. That's, that's our overarching goal. And what we're looking at really is creating um, a supportive network of existing organizations. We're not aiming to create um, or recreate what already exists. We're not looking to, to um, replace what already exists, but yet to enhance it. And what we did is we based this a lot on, on initial research that we did. And we said before we go out and decide what we want to accomplish, we, wanna, we need to understand what, what's going on in our community and, and in North America. So we took a look at North American trends and best practices. Um, we looked at what exists currently in Montreal in terms of offerings, and we went fairly far. We, we broadened our definition of Jewish learning just to make sure that we were looking at what exists very broadly in the community. And we also ran a series of focus groups. It was very important for us to hear from people from different age groups, because this initiative is really from cradle to grave. We're not looking just at, at, uh, at children and teens or, or young families. And we wanted to hear from people in terms of what they're interested in what they're interested in and what they perceive to be the challenges for their for their connection. Um, so part of our our objective really is to increase the number of participants and increase the depth and the, int the number of interactions that exist. What's very important to us is to have some key values guiding the initiative. One of them is that it be learner focused. So we do not believe that a top-down approach is going to be effective in our community. We really think that members of the community need to be active participants in the learning that they're going to be engaged in. We think it's very important to have programs be accessible. Part of that, we're, design we're creating a website. I mean, we're not going to get into detail now. But people need to know what's going on in the community. One of our big findings is that there were a lot of great things already going on in the community that people just didn't know about. So we need to act as a, as a, as a repository of information for the community. Excellence is also needs to be a driving value. People will not come back if they do not perceive a program to be of high quality. Um, it's no longer good enough to be the okay program that you send your kids to because it's competing with everything else in, in people's lives. Um, we need to make sure that the learning is intentional and collaborative. I think like you, we are really looking at uh, collaborations across um, the community and across the system. We need to capitalize on key moments. There are people who have very specific moments in their lives where they're interested 
in connecting to the community. We need to use those moments as entry points and then to build on them and not use them as entry and exit points at the same time. So, you know, the bar mitzvah is often used as the, or the bar bat mitzvah is the, is the classic example, but then we just drop them. People walk in, we have them for a year, and then we no longer see them again. So we need to use that as a jumping and an entry point. We also need to use technology and innovation in our system in a different way. So really to make things more accessible, but also as new entry points for, for different parts of our community. Um, I think that's about it. That's great. So, uh, no, Me? Jim. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jim Rogerson. Well, um, my position is new, as is the learning department at United Synagogue for Conservative Judaism. All of the, uh, we serve preschools, congregational schools, day schools, the youth movement, USY, the gap year program, and all of the uh, summer travel programs in Israel and in, in the US. So part of my job was, or is, to create this uh, seamless connection amongst hundreds of organizations and the delivery of various uh, learning systems uh, in a, some cohesive way. Another goal is to get other arms and organizations within the conservative movement to work together to create a lifelong learning path so that kids who are involved in USY or Ramah or Schechter or their congregational learning uh, perceive themselves to be part of a, a full quilt, so to speak, of education that reinforces each part you know, to the other. Um, another goal that we have is to use to create environments in which Jewish learning empower synagogues to not only change the world, but to transform themselves to be more dynamic and engaging institutions. And when it comes to the levers or the methodologies, I want to go in a little bit uh, different direction here. Instead of focusing on specific programs, what we talk about is the institutional capacity. And one of the quotes that I have up on my board that I look at every day is, vision without a plan is a daydream. Mm -hmm. Planning without a vision is a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> really what we talk about and what we try to get out to our congregations is if they are not mission aligned organizations, the programmatics will be a matter of chasing one's tail always looking for the latest thing that'll bring in a couple more kids or a couple more families. It has to be, the educational program has to be um, part of the mission of the synagogue and it has to be represented as such both in personnel and budget and the way it's articulated through all parts of the synagogue. So the areas that we focus on are mission alignment, board training, long-term visioning, strategic financial planning, creating community as both a curriculum source and a reinforcement for Jewish learning, and connecting all the arms of the concerted movement to have a common vision, so that when people experience learning, uh, however it's expressed, they'll see a coherence from camp to school to home to synagogue. So really, what we're trying to focus on is getting people to understand that their organization has to have certain markers of readiness to have quality discussions about education so that then the innovation, the new programs, the collaboration will take hold and you won't keep revisiting things because they've, they've failed through lack of execution. If there's a new need because of external factors in the uh, ecosystem, that's great. Then you'll be ready for change. But if you're not, you'll keep chasing after things. So mission alignment and re institutional readiness. Thank you again. As Leora said, my name is Sarah Steinberg, and I'm the CEO of Shalom Learning, which is actually a for-profit entity. So I guess I represent the entrepreneurs of the world uh, today um, in, um, in Jewish education. And what we do is we have a blended learning uh, program that combines technology, curriculum, and teacher resources. But what I'd like to um, talk about for just a, a minute is a question that I think is a broader question that came to me as I came into this world from higher education and also 
from, uh, from the business area. And that would be, in higher education, we're talking a lot about the return on education. And uh, the common way of thinking about that right now is that the return on education is a job. It's just as simple as that. Of course, it's not as simple as that, but that's how it's being described, and people are grabbing a hold of it. What's the return on a Jewish education? And when you think about an R-O-J-E, a return on a Jewish education, it begins to take the problem of solving problems in Jewish education back one step to defining exactly what the problem statement is and what we're trying to achieve. So at Shalom Learning, we think a lot about engagement. We think about lifelong learning. We think about Jewish literacy. And frankly, we think about everything that all the people at the table have already talked about. And when I think about the levers that we're using um, to stay with the theme of the ecosystem, there are three of them that come right to mind. We're adding technology and curriculum to the mix. We are subtracting time and space from the mix. In other words, with technology, you don't have to be in a particular space or a particular time. And we're combining parents and children because part of our curriculum has a required Chavara experience where the children and the parents come together with the educational directors or the teachers uh, at least once a month to focus on the value that's being uh, focused in that particular month in our curriculum. So for us, that's how we're doing it, but I hope that also what we talk about on this panel is what we th think we're trying to achieve in terms of a return on our Jewish education. Thank you. So just to give positive reinforcement, this is exactly where I hoped that we would be. Great. Um, Sid, you started us off on the next question that we want to focus on. You um, mentioned the challenge of staffing change, not change in staffing, but having the appropriate staff to implement change, having enough, having people with the right kinds of, um, of, of skills and abilities and support. So I want to open it up to the rest of the panel. What are some of the challenges that you've encountered? Sid talked about um, the placement of the coalition educators. What are you doing? to um, address the, the challenges, and you'll still get a chance for more challenges. So we're still at our infancy, so we're just thinking about the challenges. We haven't necessarily addressed them. Um, one of the challenges, though, in talking about what the Jewish learning is the sense of competing with the Jewish day schools. And that's, that's a challenge that is underneath and on top of a lot of the discussions that take place. Because for us, this is about lifelong Jewish learning and there's an underlying fear that if you create great programming outside of Jewish day schools, that it'll draw families away. So I don't have the answer to how we're addressing it, but part of our vision and our eventual dream is for the day schools actually to be a partner in the initiative. I don't know how we're gonna get there exactly, but you know, the part of the dream is for the day schools to become places of learning, whether you're a day school student or not, but there's an opportunity for family learning, for after school learning, and that if the schools can see themselves as a partner in this, that'll be one of our six potential successes. One of the things that we do at Shalom Learning is that we partner with synagogues to enhance the education programs, and the problem that we're facing right now is identifying who the decision makers are in the synagogues. And uh, it's, it's uh, different in every synagogue. And one of the things that I would uh, love to see is a, a, the possibility of empowering uh, people to make decisions who might um, be in positions that aren't necessarily the traditional place where the decision um, to do something different in the synagogue um, 
might be. So actually, as a follow-up, do you see that as a unique challenge for a nonprofit or for someone who sits on the perch where you do? Or do you all think that it's the same? So I can't speak for these guys, um, but I know from my perch it's a, uh, it's a definite um, problem. Um, not only is it time consuming for us, we're in a business, we're trying to move decisions forward, so just to get to the practical side of things, but I actually think it's a problem for the organizations that we're trying to uh, partner with because it's not clear to them, in, in my experience, it's not clear to them always who has the veto power and where the actual um, decision making rests. Well, so I can relate to that as an organization where our, our field consultants are asked on a daily basis, should we buy that program? Should we do this program? Will it work? Will it not work? And, and just as Sarah pointed out, they're often trying to make these decisions off in the school wing on their own, and they have a lot of concerns. What will parents say? What will the board say? Can we afford it? Do they really back this? Is there pressure to change for change's sake so that we'll be competitive and innovative? Does it align with my goals? And I go back to what I said before, that, that sense of who's in, not just who's in charge, but what's the mission? And therefore, when decision making happens, you, you don't worry as much about the authority as opposed to the alignment. Does it match what you're about? Then it's not about the who, it's about what we're trying to accomplish. So when people call and say, should we use Shalom Learning, for instance, we say, yeah, we think you should take a look, but tell us how you go about making these decisions, and then you'll find out, and you'll be able to engage with them better. I'd love to speak to mission and goal. And to just share my personal view, that we've made a very large mistake when we talk about our work is to help people on their Jewish journey. And a hush came over the room. And I think the problem with it is that we are bifurcating human beings. And I'd like to say that in my own perspective, our work is to help young people grow to have purpose and meaning, to be strong and resilient, to have joy um, so for themselves and to help the rest of the world. And Judaism is their well. It's their birthright. I know someone took that title. It's their birthright that they don't have, you know, you don't have to go to a therapist and you don't have to get your advice online. Actually, being part of Judaism is in service of it. And to me, when our goal is not, I teach at HUC and I used to say to the students, I'm going to say something, but don't repeat it because I'll be fired. The mission of synagogues is not Torah, Avodah, and Gimelut Chasadim, because who is knocking on your door asking, I want another piece of Torah. Where do I get the Avodah? So to me, our purpose and our mission is to speak to your life question, to speak to your yearning to be connected, to be known and seen, and the richness of Judaism speaks to that. So for me personally, my, my pulpit is really about quotidian. It is about the Judaism that enables us to live in our daily lives. And if we can shift to say that's the outcome, to me then all the dominoes behind it shift. So where are the greatest openings, the potential, the opportunities to bring about this shift that you're talking about. Um, we talked about the challenges. Where's the place where the door's cracked open? I'll just throw it out there. I think the uh, biggest opportunity is with the teachers. And uh, the teachers have 
uh, in, in cases that I've been experiencing, and this is a gross general generality, I um, admit freely, um, don't have access to all of the resources that they need. And they are, uh, have expressed to me many times a request that we form a repository of information and curriculum uh, examples. And I know these repositories already exist. So if they exist, we're not doing a good job of getting them out there so that the teachers know. And then the second thing that the teachers are asking for is that they want a community so that they can share best practices with one another globally, not just in their community, but all over the entire world. And that's what technology is perfect for. Um, that's, we already have the tools to do that. And so I think that's the greatest opportunity is to help the teachers close the gap on those two issues. So I don't disagree, but I, I think where the door is open now is when, in, with our teens and our young adults. They're already living the world very differently. If I look at my kids and they don't have a sense of ownership of their information, they put everything online, they co-create already, I think we really need to turn to that generation and start creating things with them. And I, and I think the door is open in the sense that I see an emergence of a re-curiosity and an interest in engaging as long as we open the door even wider for these young people. And I would say that we need to work with them to, to co-create and that if we think that as older adults or as adults creating systems for them, we're going to do it for them, I think then we're wrong. And I think that we really need to use them and their, I would say their natural inclination is the way they navigate the world to create the new opportunities. I believe that your greatest opportunity is where your success is already. So everybody here works in an organization that you can say, I know when we are at our best. And I think that you get a group of people around a table and you say, what is the moment? What do we see resulting in that moment? And what's enabling that? And there is the gem and that's, or the key that totally unlocks the door to a better, stronger tomorrow. I wasn't going to say this, but because you've already hit that, so I had to think of something to say. So I want uh, to say something about rabbis. I think the nature of education for rabbinical students needs to anticipate what life will be like in congregations, whether it's the journeys that people are going on at different times of their life, what an institution could look like that would encourage and empower those kind of journeys, and what the relationship is between rabbis and congregants that encourage them to do, not only go on their journeys and find the return on Jewish investment for them, but to not rely on the rabbi as the person who does it for them or instead of them. And I think that's a huge paradigm shift that has to happen is rabbis need to, and they need to be freed up by their boards to fulfill that, that sense of mission as well. So here's the biggie. Um, and I promised you I was going to ask this. Um, you talked about a number of levers. You've talked about the ways that you're using different strategies to introduce support change. Um, we've highlighted where some of the current stumbling blocks are and how you're overcoming them. But I've fallen into the trap. Um, of still thinking kind of on the institutional level, on the community level, national, entrepreneurial. So now could we really zoom out and think about what are some possible steps now that we have this brain trust in the room to think about fostering greater collaboration and coordination of activity locally, continentally, beyond that, 
bet and between local communities and continental infrastructures, how can we build that kind of a, um, a network of change makers in order to be able to work together productively? Well, I, I think I think I might respond to that question with, can we actually build that network of change makers? And I, I want to think of this in two different levels, because I think that on the ground for the practitioners, I think it's happening, at least in New York City, in a very real way right now. And I think we can point to a lot of reasons why it's happening on the level of the teachers, the educators, the people on the ground. We go to the same conferences. We were trained in the same institutions. Um, we grew up going to the same summer camps. We are involved in our 20s with organizations like Teva or Avoda or Wexner or Leadership Institute. We go abroad to Israel and we study in Hebrew University or Pardes. So we all know each other and we're kind of a chevre and we're glad to see one another and we enjoy those occasions to get together and it comes naturally to us to want to hear each other's ideas and share them and we like each other and also, you know, Jewish educators. It's a particularly boring group of people. Who's, who are we going to get a drink with if not each other? Um, but I think when we're talking on the institutional level, there's still a great deal of um, anxiety especially around funding and resources once we start thinking about collaboration. And I think there's very much still a zero-sum game kind of thinking in play of if this is my member, then that person can't be your member. And if we're competing for the same funding, either you're going to get it or I'm going to get it. And there isn't really a sense of, so what's the add-on value that we actually are going to get? What's the benefit if we're both doing this together side by side? If we're publishing a textbook, then why do we want to see your textbook succeed? If I'm running, you know, Shalom Learning, why would I want to start supporting some other distance learning opportunity? And I think that that's a question that we, we really need to grapple with in terms of how do we all get the benefit of working together. And I'll just suggest that I think that you're right in terms, Elizabeth, of this co-creation that's happening among young people. Um, the sociologist Dana Boyd had an article recently in which she looked at teens and um, geeks, like tech, techies, I don't know if you saw this, and how people who work at like internet startups they're often, they don't actually have their own office space. So they sit in these big open spaces with everybody sort of at different booths. And like, so each of us might be working for different internet startup and they will share actual like programming ideas, like code with one another very comfortably because they know that in another two years, your startup may have succeeded and mine may have failed and I may be working for you in another two years. And so there's, they know that there's a fluidity. And I think that when we're talking on the professional level, there's a similar sort of fluidity. The teachers who are teaching you know, in your after-school program on Tuesdays are teaching in my after-school program on Thursdays and in your summer camp in the summer. And so there's a sense that like, you know, we all know each other on the practitioner level, and we, we want to see each other succeed. Um, I, I think that I really have a question. Once we're talking about the institutional or organizational level, will they follow the same sort of lead of the tech startups and say, yes, there is a value in sharing code with one another, even if in the end what it means is you're using my code to succeed and my company falls apart. So I couldn't agree more. I, I happen to be a person who sees the world through rose-colored glasses and my glass is always half full. Um, there's a term that, in addition to, I hope you'll remember R-O-J-E, I hope you'll also remember coopetition. Coopetition means that all boats rise. There isn't one program that will be the solution. Every learner is different, every student is different, and everybody has a different objective for what they are looking for. And a different goal, frankly. Uh, in my view, anyway. <laughs> so in that, in, if you take that as the case, then there is room for plenty of ideas um, because there need to be 
plenty of opportunities for people to choose from. And if we all focus on having the best opportunities and the best programs out there, then all the boats will rise. And that, that's how I feel. I, I saw alluded to this. I think the number one thing we need to do is invest in a lot of tequila and get people around the table, and I think some of the barriers will go down. <laughs> um, <laughs> But seriously, um, I'm a big believer in, in data-driven decision-making. And I think that we haven't appealed to some of our funding partners in a way that they understand uh, about the importance of collaboration. And one of the things that the day school world has done very well, uh, in, and they had the private school world to lead the way, is benchmarking. And not just things like how what the expenditure is per student for this, that, or the other thing, or teacher-student ratio. But some of the core values and cultural issues that are embedded in school life that you can measure, and you know, Douglas Reeves, who's a, a guru of measurement, said you, you measure the things you care about. If collaboration is one of those things, what would it look like? How do you embed it in the life of an organization? How do you monitor it, and how do you value it and celebrate those successes? And it's not just about how many kids you have in this school. It's what's it like being an educator or a rabbi in this school or in this synagogue. And if you care about collaboration, you measure it, you program it, you celebrate it. I'm glad you said that because I was actually thinking, I, I'm taking it from the perspective of a, a funder. And I think funders and federations, because we're still in a federated world, need to actually fund collaboration. Because we often pay lip service to it, and we don't actually intentionally fund collaboration and say we believe there's an inherent value in it and in putting partners together we think that the the whole will be greater than the sum of the parts the the other thing i think that needs to happen to build a network is we have to give up some kind of control i think um, as communities we're very risk adverse um, and we're very into controlling the outcomes. And I think we need to have some margin of error. I think we need to allow some flexibility, some testing of ideas, even though they might fail, celebrating our failures. I don't think it's a bad thing in the Jewish world. I think it's a good thing. Um, and really understanding that we might not see the results of our labors immediately. So, And I agree that we need to test things, but at the same time, we need to understand that you don't always see the results of what we do because they might be happening somewhere else that you've just kind of planted a seed. So, so in, in New York, when I came nine years ago, congregations did not speak to each other and learn from each other. That was the culture. Today, these 50 congregations learn from each other, gather together. So you have to say kind of what's changed. So I think one piece is there's just this big cloud that maybe is full of sunshine that's coming that's changing how we understand the world. And that's the network approach. We can talk until whatever. The, the way we live in the world, the way we are in this world connecting is through networks. But the truth is that these congregations have also needed a tremendous amount of support to help them learn to work in an entirely different way. And if I tell you just as an example, when we had this idea, congregations with similar issues would come together and discuss and learn from each other. What did we learn? People didn't know how to do that. They didn't know how to tell their story in a way that you could understand and grow from it. They didn't know how to listen to each other. To say that you, at the most basic level, have to help people, that I'm sharing my uh, need and my question in a way that isn't bragging, but rather is true discovery. So somewhere, I think we need to lay out what are the continua of skills Yes, we have this big idea, but there really is a developmental approach if we're going to be able to do that. And of course, the way to do that is to learn from the successes that we have. So I want to thank the panel. I also want to let you know that you don't have to now be quiet because we're opening it to everybody else. Um, you can hop into the conversation again. But they think about them as the the first respondents. And so now, um, can uh, let's open it up to, uh, to those in the room and those in the bigger virtual room. Um, what 
what would it take? What are the challenges that need to be overcome? And what would it take to create this network that everybody here has been talking about so eloquently? Have any of you had success stories? They told a lot about success stories. Okay, I think one of the issues is territoriality, um, that people want to own ownership, and I think the um, institutions or all the partners have to be open to working with one another and not say, this is mine, no, this is mine. It's really a funny, the paradox is you have to be strong enough to be humble, right? You have to, f if you're un under siege, then you're not going to, you're less likely to do the reaching out. My experience in New York, it is the congregations who have the stronger team, who have the vision, that are in a strong enough to position to say, I do actually want to learn from you. I don't need to feel like by asking for your ideas or your insight that that makes me less. So how do you feel both strong enough to be vulnerable? It's good advice for a relationship, too. We could talk about that. So I want I to toot the horn, though, of, of Sid and the group that she works with. And I think it came out a little bit in this conversation earlier, certainly in the case studies, that this is hard work, and that sometimes it's necessary to make safe space for those conversations to happen, and for there to be scaffolding, and for there to be um, very successful, almost group therapists, to be able to help people have the conversation, to feel strong and empowered enough to be able to put it Forth and to make it, as I said, safe space to be able to talk about these things without it reflecting badly on them. Which means then that on the institutional level, on the community level, on the, the continental level, and with supports from the outside and also actually brilliant ideas kind of popping in to push us, that's what it, it, it takes. And the question is, how can we continue this conversation even more deeply and with more people um, in order to be able to make that happen? Uh, one thought that I have, Leora, is I think you guys started it actually by introducing the idea of the ecosystem and bringing in uh, the ideas of somebody who thinks about it for other purposes, but we're applying the thought here for Jewish education. I think the idea is um, that what we're talking about today and have been talking about, the this isn't new. Other people have thought about it. They might have thought about it, as Saul said, you know, for tech startups or something. And um, perhaps a next step is to bring, you know, some people in for the dialogue who don't know anything about Jewish education, but know Just about. People are already here. <laughs> 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 right. You mean that wasn't why we invited the panel? <laughs> But anyway, I think there are change, change agents out there um, that, that we can learn from. I found uh, with the technology question that uh, we often, uh, I'm in conversations where we're questioning things about using technology to enhance education that have been asked for decades already. And um, we probably could take a leap ahead just by listening to some of the experts out there. I would recommend and, and celebrate the fact that if you walked into most middle school classrooms in good schools, you'll see the kind of behavior, the kind of living, this way of engaging with people, 
And the good news is they'll grow up, and if they're engaged in the Jewish community and they're in leadership positions, they'll already know how to do this. So maybe sometimes we need to look to our own kids to find out what we need to do to grow up. I just want to add to this idea of like looking to the learners and you know their questions and their needs and say, I think that there are plenty of 30, 40, and 50-year-olds who also feel the same way, that in the entire history of their Jewish involvement, no one has ever asked them what they want, what they're interested in, what they think about things. And when they've tried to just be themselves in a Jewish context, they've been told, can you please tone it down? in one way or another. And I think that it's safe for us to talk about high school students and 20-somethings, and it's threatening for us to talk about 30, 40, 50-year-olds in that way, because they're us. And I think that we need to remember that there are many people who are our peers who also feel still alienated by Jewish life and Jewish education, because we are not opening up to them the same possibilities that we're opening up to young people who we feel much safer with because they're our children and our grandchildren. I think we have time for just one, unfortunately, and then we're going to wrap up because we promised to get you out. Um, I'm wanting, it's not a perfectly framed question, but I'm wanting to just get some feedback around this idea of examples of more disruptive approaches to advancing and enhancing opportunities for Jewish education within the sort of frame of, I understand that there's a calculus of the intersection of programs and fiscal sustainability for institutions. And within that frame, the calculus requires one to evaluate the costs and the benefits of applying a more disruptive approach. And I'm thinking more like, you know, three different shuls who are in the same basic geographic district, two of them shutting down their religious schools and everybody going to one. And I understand that the evaluation has to incorporate this idea of losing membership but given that membership isn't so robust anyway, and I don't mean that in a pejorative way, but just given that you know the institutions are already having sagging and lagging membership, and so the fiscal model is already broken, are there examples that incorporate more disruptive approaches that are also um, sustainable both in terms of content and institutional uh, survival? I don't know if anybody wants to tackle that one. <laughs> I. Um, UJ Federation is hosting a whole day looking at the financial implications, the business models aligned to new missions. So that actually is being live streamed. So if you want, it's Synergy UJ Federation. That That's might N E G Y. No, it's next week. I'm on that panel. Today was dress rehearsal. Um, and I love the rhymes that come out of Montreal. That's great. Right? Thank you. I'm going to, we promised that we would get people out because there are flights that some of our folks from out of town need to make. So uh, I want to begin by thanking the panel. Obviously, we could go on for a while. There's a lot more to be said and a lot of good questions out there. And hopefully that will serve as a spur and a catalyst for other such convenings and other such conversations. Uh, as Saul indicates, they are taking place, um, but they're not always accessible to all of us. And one of our challenges, I think, is to think about who would want to be involved in these kinds of conversations. Today, we have a lot of professionals in this room, but we know that there are parents, and there are students, and there are funders, and there are lay leaders who also need to be part of this conversation and I think with the right kinds of um, uh, invitations and opportunities um, can be part of these uh, conversations and can contribute enormously. We've already heard about the people from whom we can learn, who may not be part of our world, but who have much to teach us. So hopefully this is just the beginning. When we began, uh, as Leora indicated, this series of convenings this winter and spring, we did it not out of a sense that there was imminent catastrophe or a sense that we were dealing with a failed Jewish education system, but rather I think in the spirit that we've heard today that there is so much good that is happening that we really need to begin to publicize it, to make it visible, and to build on it. And that's what we've tried to do over these last three convenings. 
And I think I go away certainly feeling that we have amply proven the case that we made at the beginning, that this is a system in dramatic transformation, that there are wonderful people doing wonderful things, and that if we can begin to come together uh, as a group, we can take those things and make them even uh, greater. I want to thank our uh, hosts here at Federation CJA, and I'm going to turn it over to Steve in a second to distribute some um, evaluation things. Y yeah, you'll, you'll uh, give them out. Please do take one and fill it out before you leave. Uh, I want to thank all of the co-sponsors who've been part of this, and I especially want to thank our partners at the Jewish Education Project who have worked with us uh, and really initiated in many ways the Jewish Futures uh, endeavor. Uh, for those of you who are interested, there is a Jewish Futures Conference also coming up in New York on June 4th, and David Breifman would kill me if I didn't mention that that too will be available for those of you up here in Montreal or Toronto or elsewhere who are away from New York. That too will be available online. We would love to see more people there in person. New York in June is beautiful, and we'll be at the Museum of Jewish Heritage which uh, is, a, is a gorgeous sight uh, at the Battery. But if you can't make it, please do tune in. It'll be dealing with whose Torah is it anyway, uh, Jewish text in the contemporary world. So again, thanks to all of you for coming. Thanks to everybody on the live stream, and especially those of you on the live stream who took the time to tweet in and to email in. Uh, we do value your contributions as well. And we will continue this conversation. Thank you all.